Welcome to the British International Sports Medicine Academy. Today we're covering the Level 2 unit Anatomy and Physiology for Exercise. This forms part of our Level 2 Certificate in Fitness Instructing as well as our Level 3 Diploma in Personal Training. In this unit, we'll cover basic anatomy and physiology relating to exercise programming for apparently healthy adults of all ages. Skeletal system. Facts about our skeleton. We have 206 bones within our body. Bones attached to each other through ligaments. Ligaments are a form of connective tissue. Bones attached to muscle via tendons. Tendons are another type of connective tissue within the body. Cartilage cover the ends of our bones at a joint. A joint is where two bone ends meet. We classify the skeleton in two separate sections, axial and appendicular. Why is our skeleton so important? Let's look at some of the functions of the skeleton. Without the skeleton, we won't be able to move because muscles attach via tendons to our long bones, also known as the body's levers. And when a muscle contracts, they pull on the bones to cause movement. Storage. Bones store minerals such as calcium and magnesium, phosphate. The structure. Without bones, we wouldn't have the structure that we have. The skeleton gives the body shape and provides a framework for muscle attachments. Protection. If you look at the bones, they're usually protecting some major organ. For example, the rib cage protects the heart and the lungs. Our pubic bones protect our reproductive organs. Our cranium bones protect our brain. Production. Certain bones contain bone marrow where white and red blood cells are produced. In this slide, you have two pictures of the skeleton. Let's start off with the one on the right. That's called the axial skeleton. Its main function is protection. It lies on the long axis or midline of the body, and it includes the skull, vertebrae, sternum, and rib cage. On the left, you have the appendicular skeleton. This part of the skeleton provides movement. It includes bones of the shoulder girdle, arms and hands, and the pelvic girdle, legs and feet. Bones. Bone classification. We have five different types of bones in our body. Long bones have greater length than width and are slightly curved for strength, which helps to absorb the stress of the body. Examples of long bones are the femur, which is the longest bone in the body, the thigh bone, as well as the tibia, which you can find in our lower legs. Both long bones and short bones provide movement. Short bones also are needed to help provide strength. Short bones are somewhat cube-shaped and nearly equal in length and width. Examples include the carpals found in your wrist. Irregular bones have very complex shapes. Examples include the bones of the spinal column as well as many of our facial bones. Flat bones are usually thin and provide protection for internal organs as well as a large surface area for muscle attachment. Examples of flat bones include the pelvis as well as the sternum. Sesamoid bones are bones that are embedded within a tendon. An example includes the patella or knee bone. The skeletal system. Let's begin learning some of the bones you're required to know at level two. Beginning at the top of the skeleton, you have the cranium or the skull, and this protects our brain. Then you have the mandible, which is the jawbone. And then let's go down to our vertebrae. The vertebral column is split into five different sections. The cervical spine, the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, the sacrum, as well as the coccyx. Then you have the clavicle, also known as the collarbone. Moving to the bones in the upper back, you have the scapula, also known as our shoulder blades, the humerus, which is the bone in our upper arms, and moving down to the bone in our forearms, you have the radius as well as the ulna. The bones in our wrist are called carpals, and the bones in our hands are called metacarpals, and our fingers are called phalanges. Let's move back up to the chest, where you have what's known as the breastbone or sternum, 
and moving down to our pelvis. We've left one of the bones without a label. Please take a moment and look up what the name of this bone is. Ilium. Ilium as well as the ischium are two bones on both sides of the body that form our pelvis. At the bottom of the spine, as I mentioned earlier, you have the sacrum just above the coccyx. Within our legs, we have the longest bone in the body, the thigh bone, the femur, and then in our lower legs, we have the tibia and the fibula. Our ankle bones are called tarsals, the bones of the feet are called metatarsals, and our toes are called phalanges. And not to forget our knee bone, the patella. And those are the bones you're required to know at level two. The process of bone growth is called ossification. Ossification is usually completed by the age of 25. The process of ossification is enabled through two cells, namely osteoblast, which are bone building cells, and osteoclasts, which clear away old bone. Joints. Joint classification. A joint is where two bone ends meet. We have three different classifications of joints within the body. We have immovable joints, for example, within our skull, and these are also known as fused or fibrous, so they don't move. Then we have slightly movable within the thoracic vertebrae, for example, and these are also known as cartilaginous joints. And then we have freely movable joints, for example, at our shoulder, and these are known as synovial joints. So here's the structure of a freely movable or synovial joint. If you focus on the bone ends, at both bone ends you have articular cartilage. And this is important for shock absorption and to prevent the bone ends from rubbing together. So it lines the ends of the bones to allow for smooth movement. And then you have the joint capsule. And this capsule encloses the joint cavity. Within the joint capsule, you can find the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane secretes synovial fluid into the joint once activity begins. And synovial fluid is important, it lubricates our joints. Joint actions. Joint actions. So these are the terms that we use to explain certain movements. Please stand as we go through these so that you can follow along and try some of these movements to get a deeper understanding. Let's begin with flexion. Flexion is defined as when you reduce the angle at the joint or to bend a limb. For example, let's bend the arm at the elbow. So bend lifting the forearm up. That is flexion at the elbow. Let's move to extension. Extension is to return from flexion, so increase the angle at the joint, or to straighten a limb. For example, let's say you had just done a bicep curl. Now I want you to lower your arm back to the starting position. So lower your arm back to the sides of your body. This is extension. Adduction. Adduction is to bring towards or across the midline of the body. For example, when you draw the leg across the body. So lift your leg out to the side. When you bring that leg back down to a standing position, that is adducting the leg. Abduction. Abduction is to take away from the midline of the body. For example, raising the arm or leg out to the side. Plantar flexion is to point the toes away from the body. For example, when you're pointing the toes in ballet or gymnastics. Dorsiflexion is the opposite. It's to pull the toes toward the body. For example, flexing the foot. Rotation. Rotation is a rotary movement, turning the thoracic spine to the side. For example, when you twist the spine or twist the trunk towards the side. Circumduction is a circular movement at different points of the body. For example, when you do arm circles. Lateral flexion is to bend sideways with the trunk or neck. Pronation is to turn the palms down and supination is to turn the palms up. Inversion and eversion are covered within the level three unit anatomy and physiology. Muscles of the body. 
We have three types of muscles within the body. Voluntary or skeletal muscle is striated in appearance and these muscles are involved in exercise and are under our conscious control. Involuntary forms of muscle tissue are smooth muscle, which you'll find in the digestive tract artery walls and they're under our unconscious control. Cardiac muscle is striated as well however it's involuntary muscle and you find this within the heart and again it's under unconscious control. Our skeletal muscle system. We're going to begin with our anterior facing muscles. Deltoid. The deltoid is your shoulder muscle. Then you have your pectoralis major, which is your chest muscle. The biceps, the bicep group in your upper arms. And then you have your rectus abdominis and your transverse abdominis, which form part of your core, along with your internal and external obliques. Moving down, you have your adductors as well as your quadricep group. And within your lower leg you have the tibialis anterior found on top of your tibia or shin bone. Now let's cover our posterior facing muscles. In our upper back we have our trapezius and rhomboids. Then moving down slightly you have your latissimus dorsi and your erector spinae is also a muscle that forms part of your core. At the back of your upper arms you have your triceps. Moving down below the erector spinae muscles we have our gluteus maximus. We also have our abductors beneath our gluteus maximus. In the back of our upper legs we have our hamstring group and below the hamstrings you have your gastronemius and soleus muscles. The circulatory system. Here is a diagram of our heart. The heart is located in the chest slightly to the left. It is a pump a muscle that pumps blood. The heart is split into two halves. On the right side, we have deoxygenated blood flowing in and out of the heart. On the left side, you have oxygenated blood flowing in and out of the heart. The heart is split into four separate chambers. We have two upper collecting chambers called the atria, and we have two lower pumping chambers called the ventricles. We have valves within the heart that ensure the flow of blood is one way. Within the body, we have three different types of blood vessels, arteries, veins, and capillaries. Arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart, and as a result, they have thicker muscular walls because blood is pumped under pressure. There's only one artery that transports deoxygenated blood. That's called the pulmonary artery, and it transports deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. Veins carry deoxygenated blood back towards the heart. They have thin muscular walls and they also have valves that assist the blood flow back to the heart and prevent backflow of blood. There's only one vein that carries oxygenated blood and that's called the pulmonary vein. And this vein transports oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart. Capillaries allow arteries and veins to join together. And because capillaries are only one cell thick, they also allow for gaseous exchange. For example, it allows the uptake of oxygen into the muscle from the arteries via the capillaries, and then the uptake of carbon dioxide into the veins from the muscle via the capillaries. The respiratory system. We have two main muscles involved in respiration, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. The diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle and when it contracts it increases the abdominal cavity and makes room for the lungs to expand. The intercostal muscles also do this. They are the muscles that run between the ribs and help with thoracic breathing. The respiratory system. Let's follow the flow of air. We breathe in through our nose. It flows down through our pharynx, larynx, trachea, then branches off via our bronchus and bronchioles into the alveoli, where diffusion takes place. Diffusion 
is gaseous exchange, and it's the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out of the alveoli. The alveoli are functional units within the lungs. We have millions of them in each of our lungs. When we inhale air, it flows through the respiratory system, through the alveoli, into the pulmonary capillaries, then into the pulmonary vein, which then feeds into the left atrium, then the left ventricle, and is pumped via the aorta around the body. The aorta is an artery that leaves the left ventricle and pumps blood around the body. And then this process is reversed. Deoxygenated blood is pumped back to the heart and from the heart it's pumped into the lungs via the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary capillaries then uptake carbon dioxide and move it into the alveoli where we then move it back through the respiratory system to be expired. Energy systems. We have three sources of energy. Energy comes from the food we eat, from carbohydrates, fat, and protein. We break down these macronutrients into different forms, but the end result is to produce adenosine triphosphate, which is the body's energy currency. The body produces ATP in three different ways. We have three different energy systems. Let's start with the phosphocreatine system. This system is used for high intensity, short duration activities lasting up to only 15 seconds. And these are predominantly anaerobic, such as sprinting and powerlifting. And the energy is supplied by existing creatine phosphate stores within the muscle. Lactic acid system. This is used for moderate to high intensity or short duration activities lasting 30 to 40 seconds. It's also anaerobic, meaning without the presence of oxygen. And the energy supplied for lactic acid system to help us make adenosine triphosphate is from glycogen. Glycogen is stored within our muscle and liver cells. Then we have the aerobic, which is the most efficient out of all of the energy systems and it's used for low to moderate longer duration activities lasting 90 seconds or more and this is aerobic meaning we need oxygen to produce adenosine triphosphate or ATP and the energy source for this energy system is glycogen carbohydrates as well as fats nervous system the nervous system controls all the actions of all of the different bodily systems. The main role is to create and maintain homeostasis or balance within the body. It has three main functions or three ways in which it achieves this. Through sensory input, so collecting information from inside as well as outside the body. And then interpretation, so it analyzes and interprets the information that it's received. And then there's a motor output. So a response is created to the information that's been analyzed and a decision is made on what to do. And this is done by activating the relevant bodily systems. The structure of the nervous system. We have the central nervous system that comprises of the brain and the spinal cord. Then we have the peripheral nervous system that consists of 31 pairs of nerves that branch from the central nervous system, so branch off from our spinal cord. And they send messages back and forth from the CNS. The peripheral nervous system is split into two separate branches, the somatic and the autonomic. The somatic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that is under under our conscious control. An example would be our skeletal muscles. The autonomic nervous system is not under our conscious control and it also has two separate branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for speeding things up, for example increasing our heart rate, and the parasympathetic system is responsible for bringing everything back to its normal levels. So it would reduce the heart rate. Thank you for listening. Today we've covered the skeletal system, the bones of the body, joint classifications and actions, the muscles of the body, the circulatory system, as well as the respiratory systems and energy systems. And we ended the session with the nervous system.